so it's saying we're going live then okay there we go we're live all right hello everyone welcome along to our first virtual lecture uh i am very happy to be joined today by uh sandy jeffs who is one of the uh, much revered same <laughs> australia lived experience ambassadors and sandy oh you somebody likes the d's they're saying go oh, D's. i know and they've done my mental health in big time this year they're the, they're the sole purpose, yeah. they're the sole reason why i'm crazy chris <laughs> it's a Melbourne Football Club. i think they have that effect on a lot of oh, people they have 50 years of drama with them yeah There's 50 years of awfulness and you know they're just they're building my character well well that's right yeah. stress inoculation that's right yeah that's right yeah oh, they're dumb in so thanks for saying hello everybody in the chat uh can you hear us okay are we loud enough for you um so okay thanks tam thanks for letting us know <laughs> hi buzzwit okay so um I think the way in which we can proceed today is really to maybe have a little bit of a discussion, uh, Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked about some of the things that the students have been learning already. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Black Orc, for letting us know about the uh, volume. We should be calling you Blue Orc, I think. Um, Jackie Fan says, hello, Chris. Hello, Jackie Fan. Hey, Jackie Fan, you know I actually know Jackie Chan. <laughs> this is true. I once made a movie with Jackie Chan. Oh, as one does. When I was a marine mammal trainer. So if you ever have a look at um, the movie First Strike, mm -hmm. it was called. He made that at the theme park where I was working. And at some point, there's a seal pretending to be a shark. <laughs> and waving hello to Jackie, and I was just off stage giving it the wave <laughs> command. No oh dear. Um, all right, so let's have a look at all of these people saying hello. They're all um, very, I think, happy to be joining us. I see, but a, I see a go D's there. See a go D's. Bazwit mm -hmm. says hello, Sandy. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, Amelia says, hi, Sandy. Lots of people saying hi. Fantastic. Um, all right. So, mm -hmm. Sandy, I wonder if we might set the scene for the students. Mm -hmm. So they've all been to the DAC Centre recently and they've read some of your poetry. So they would know, I suppose, a little bit about you and your poetry. Mm -hmm but maybe you could tell them a little bit more about your experience of mental health issues and I suppose whatever you'd like to well, tell them. I'll start at the beginning, Chris. Okay. That's it's the best place to start. Yeah. So uh, back in 1976, which is a long time ago. When I, I was, was born. When you were born. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's how old I am. <laughs> um, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So this is a time when that diagnosis was an absolute death sentence. Mm. I remember being told by one of the doc <coughs> doctors at the time <clears throat> that with each episode of psychosis I had, mm. I would go deeper into madness from which I'd never recover. Mm. So in those days, it was a death sentence. Uh, it was a hopelessness. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a deep hopelessness associated with that diagnosis. Mm. And it wasn't spoken of. It, no, schizophrenia and recovery weren't spoken of in the same sentence. Mm. Mm. So it was a really, really grim time to be diagnosed with it. Uh, you know, I, I've had a I've had a prodromal you no know, time. There've been a lead up to it. I didn't know I was going crazy because you just don't know. Mm. So because in 1976 I was supposed to get a job. I had um, graduated from university with an arts degree mm -hmm. in 1975. I was supposed to be getting a job, getting into a career, and having a positive future, and it didn't happen because in 1976. At the beginning of that year, I started hearing voices in my head, but they were only little whispers and they, and they were quiet, they were muted. I didn't know they were part of an illness. And during that year, they built and they built and they built. And by the end of that year, they were railing in my head. And um, I, you know, 
I'd been on the dole that year too, so I, I hadn't had a job. I, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get a job because I'd really been unraveling. I think from first year uni onwards, mm. you know, I'd gone. To, I'd left home home in Ballarat to come to Melbourne to go to La Trobe University, living in college, and I remember how during those years of living in college and then getting added to the um, living in the house in Croydon and then Warrandyte, my thought processes just weren't quite right. Mm-hmm. You know, something was going wrong, and and um, I was losing my confidence i was losing the concept that i had any capacity to do anything mm. um i was uh just just getting things really um that were really odd in my mind that just wasn't quite right and i didn't know that this was the big building pattern of a of, a, of an emerging mental illness so um i couldn't get a job and so in 1976 what i did was went back to university to start an, an mm. economics degree because it was like a sheltered workshop for mm-hmm, me, mm-hmm. and also uni was free mm-hmm. in those days, so there were no, no fees to pay. Mm-hmm. So I started a part-time economics degree, but I didn't finish it because I, I became unwell. So by the end of 1976, voices were railing at me. I uh, ended up doing inappropriate things. My friends became worried, and in the end, um, after a crisis occurred, which it often has to, they took me to a, a, a psych ward in the Queen Victoria Hospital in Lonsdale Street, it was just a big hospital that used to be there, and they had a psych ward. I was there for a month. They didn't know what to do with me. They referred me on to Parkville Psychiatric Unit in Poplar Road, which is now Origin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was there for three months because in those days you had long admissions to hospital. It mm-hmm. wasn't just mm-hmm. a matter of days. It was weeks. It was months, if not years. And it was at Parkville that I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And it was such a grim time because when I – had the diagnosis and realised that my future had actually come to a crashing halt. Mm. You know, um, what, what I might have done wasn't going to eventuate because here I was, psychotic, totally off my face, uh, and, all, and my hope, my my hope, you know, just evaporated, um, hope, purpose and meaning. I lost it all. Mm. Hope, mm. I, had, I had no hope, no purpose, no meaning, and I started my life then as a psych patient. Mm. And that was a grim time, really, mm. really grim time. And so I had that admission and then I had many more admissions after that. The, the first, between 1976 and 1984, I had about six or seven admissions really? to a yeah. psychiatric ward. I went, from the, cause I went from Parkville after that, I went to La Rundle mm-hmm. Psychiatric Hospital, mm-hmm. which is a big madhouse out in uh, Plenty Road, which is next to La Trobe Uni. Mm-hmm. And um, so I became a revolving door psych patient for those years. Mm-hmm. And I really did think my future was over and done with and that I had nothing to give the community, nothing to offer anybody, that my life had come to a halt. And I lay in bed most of those, for those years I lay in bed, had no reason to get up, no mm-hmm. reason to get out of bed because I wasn't doing anything. Mm-hmm. And, of course, at that time my friends were all getting on with their careers. You mm-hmm. know, I had friends who were high achievers and they were getting PhDs and getting into academia and getting their careers happening. Fantastic for them. Mm. But as I watched them um, have their successes, they reminded me of my failure. Sure. And so I felt like a failure in my own eyes, a failure in the eyes of my friends, a failure in the eyes of my family. I felt just like a big capital F failure mm. in my, in my mm. life and that was really, really hard to deal with. Mm. Well, thank you so much for all of that very <laughs> candid commentary. There's so much in there to, mm. to unpack, and I can already see lots of questions starting to pop up oh, right. there. Um, people are really interested in a range of things that you've mentioned. I There's a few things in there that I'd like to also ask you about. Um, maybe I'll ask you a single question, and then we'll go to the chat board, and we'll see okay. what the students are asking you. Mm. So it sounds like the... Um, receiving that diagnosis of schizophrenia in itself had an impact on you over and above what was happening in terms of the illness experience. Mm. It had Mm. an impact in terms of reframing what you thought was possible for your life and so forth. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I had to to think again, what was I going to do with my life? Mm. And at the time, I thought not much was going to happen. Mm. Now, I really thought, do I go on top myself now and get it over and done with? Because um, I was just so broken as a person, broken in spirit, broken in soul, so broken that I felt I had nothing to offer anybody in in any way. 
But what I did start doing, though, was I started documenting my madness in poetry. Mm. So so whilst I wasn't working or doing anything, and my friends would be out working, I'd be home all day uh, just mooching around the house or lying in bed, I did start documenting my poet, my madness in poetry. And that was, for me, crucially important because when I wrote a poem, in those days you wrote with a pen on a bit of paper. Yeah, fancy that. <laughs> fancy that. Um, when I wrote that poem, when I held that poem in my hand, it was the only evidence I had that I was alive. Yeah. That poem was evidence yeah. that I existed. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I needed to have that evidence because nothing else mm-hmm. gave me evidence that I existed. So that poem was so important. And I so I kept writing poems and kept writing poems. And in the end, I had enough for a collection. Mm. And in 1993, my friend Susan Hawthorne, who started Spinifex Press, mm-hmm. who I'd gone to uni with, so it's not what you know, it's who you know, mm. uh, she said, I'd like to publish your poems in a book. Wow, that must have been so important. That was important because in 1993, when I turned 40, because up until my 40, 40th year, I had done nothing in my life, I had not achieved nothing. Almost overnight, on the publication of that book, overnight my life changed because I went from someone with a diagnosis and label of schizophrenia to being a poet. Mm. And being a poet was a much better label than being schizo- having schizophrenia. Sure. So it was a positive label. Mm. It meant something. It meant that I had I had something to offer the world. That I had a, a reason for getting out of bed. Mm. That being creative was so crucial for me in my mm. life to feel creative. That I could bring a poem out of my imagination. That my imagination hadn't been killed off by the schizophrenia. Mm. And that mm. was important mm. to know and realise and mm. understand. Mm. So my life changed overnight with the publication of, of poems from the Madhouse. Really my embracing that identity was I, really. It, it helpful. gave me back an identity. Yeah. I lost my identity completely. Mm. It was being stripped away like a piece of Velcro, mm. and suddenly. I had an identity and it was poet mm. and that for me was a, a life-saving moment and look at everything that's come of it since you've been quite prolific with your poetry and, and even you know just in terms of these outcomes we've had 1600 students in the last week who have been learning about the experience of mental health issues and um, hopefully experiencing stigma reduction and so forth through your work, through mm. your poetry. That's, that must feel good. Oh, I, I just love creating poetry. I love writing. Yeah. I love connecting that poem with another person. And, and I've used my poetry in my talks and in my presentations as a way of trying to show the psychotic psychotic, psychotic experience to people mm. in, a way, in a way that's creative but also meaningful. Mm. You know, cause poem, mm. And in a sense, my poems can speak when I can't speak too. Because once they're out in the world, they're like giving birth to a child. I have no control over them. Mm. But people take meaning from them mm. and whatever meaning they want to make of them. But they're my gift to the world and they're my way of understanding myself, processing my stuff and, and trying to make meaning of it and make sense of it. Yeah, I really need to do that because that's the only way I can do it. Yeah, I can hear that. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Look at this chat board. It's all lit up <laughs> with so many questions. Yeah. Um, should we go back to, oh, my goodness, I think we've got more questions than we could possibly answer <laughs> already. Yeah, Let, let's start with Alicia. Uh, oh, uh, firstly, before we get to a question, look at all these compliments. I really loved your poetry, oh. says April. Mm. Ali says, your poetry really spoke to me, Sandy. Love heart. It was so powerful. Oh, I loved you. your poetry. Thank you. It's nice to get that feedback, isn't oh, it? It is. Um. All right, Alicia has got a question here for Sandy. Um, When you were hearing voices, did the voices sound like they were your own or if they were separate to you? Uh, Good question. Uh, If you have never heard a voice in your head, you cannot imagine what hearing a voice is like, what Mm. hearing voices is like. The voices I hear are not you're in a critic, critic voice where sometimes we do something and we feel as though we're being criticised internally by an an, an, inner critic. Mm. That is not the voice of schizophrenia or your conscience voice. You might do something bad and the little conscience voice will go, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That's mm-hmm. not that, that's not the voice of schizophrenia. The voices I hear sound external. So they're like other people in the room talking to me and that, that's how real they sound, as real as me talking to you. And the voices I hear are a male and a female. In the very, very beginning of my psychotic life, the voices sounded like my mother and father. But they've mm. since morphed into into other voices. So mm-hmm. 
they're now a male and female. They'll talk about me in the third person and give a running commentary on what I'm doing. Oh, look at that. And they'll swear they're very foul mouth. Okay. They're more foul mouth than me on the hockey field. Yeah, right. And that's saying something. Mm. So they'll say, oh, look at that fucking bitch. Oh, she's doing it now. She's bloody said that stupid fucking thing to that person. She's going to she's gonna destroy the world the way she's going. She's such an evil shit, you know. Mm. It's mm. just endless. And so there's endless diatribe, endless harassment, endless persecution and denigration mm. from them. Mm. So they love my pain. The, the more pain I feel, the happier my voices are. Mm. And I tend to go to these voice, go to bed to these voices every night. So not, it's my nighttime psychosis. Uh, bed's a battlefield for me. Yeah, right. I, I go, and, and, and I call them Tweedledum and Tweedledee. I've mm. named them. I've named them mm. Tweedledum and Tweedledee because I'm trying to make fun of them before they make fun of me or put me down. Mm. It's not working, but I try. Mm. But um, So the voices can be random and rambling one moment, poignant and poignant the next. Mm. And as my life evolves, they evolve with it. So when I do things like today, today when I do when I go home tonight, they will probably pull apart what I've done here today. Mm. They'll tap into that and say well, how crap I was or whatever. Mm. Um, so the voices are they have their own agenda. I do worry about them. They're very dysphoric voices. Mm. They're so dysphoric. They're so miserable. Mm. They need antidepressants themselves. <laughs> They need to be treated because their misery is so profound, mm. but they foist that misery onto me. Mm. And I wonder whether they're my own subconscious talking to me because, you know, I had bad experiences as a kid. I had a bad home life and a sexual assault at 13. Mm. And I wonder whether they're um, that the voices of my own um, self-loathing coming out in, in, in this forum of voices that, that hound me. And the voices are funny because they've changed over time too. Yeah, They used to sound... Bogan in the way they spoke. Okay. But now in the last 10 years, they've done elocution. Okay. And they now swear and, and harass and hound in a posh accent. Really? So it's, they've sort of moved from Werribee to Turak? Yes, they've moved from Werribee to Turak. Okay. Or to Brighton. Oh, to Brighton. Brighton. It's hilarious. So now they sound like actors on the line projecting, the, on the stage projecting really? their lines. They, okay. they sound posh. And I can't relate. This is so, so weird. But I think they need AEDs themselves. I think they need some psychological treatment themselves mm. because they're always exhorting me to top myself. Mm. And if I did that, they don't seem to understand that if I go, they go. Mm. And they're either suicidal voices mm. or they're stupid. I can't work out which. Mm. But sometimes they seem so smart, smarter than me because they're always a step ahead of me mm. when they make their comments and pass judgment and stuff. But they are, um, they had their own way of speaking, they had their own characteristics and had their own dramas in a way too. It sounds like it. So that, um, I can't even imagine what that is like to live with. And as we were talking about earlier, the focus of my PhD was on the experience of hearing voices, but I've never had that experience. I don't really know what it's like. You can't imagine what it's no. like. Just imagine someone's glued an iPod into your ear. And yeah. you can't pull it out. You can't yeah. get rid of it, and it's it's just, and it's it's, a, it's hounding and harassing you, and you can't pull that that, that earplug out. Mm. Um, just imagine that, and that it's, it's constant hu humiliation and and constant beration, um, and you can't get rid of it because mm. you haven't got you've got no control over it. So before we go back to the dis the discussion board, which looks like it's just getting really full, which is fantastic. I um, hearing how difficult that experience would be i'm wondering how do you look after yourself in the context of hearing those voices how what sorts of coping skills do you use to yeah um well at night time when they're harassing me i plug in my ipod and fill my mm. head with music and do you find that interferes well, with I, the experience it, of the voice a little it can it can fill that space a bit yeah but sometimes they cut through it Mm. Uh, or I, and that's important. I love music. I play, I play musical instruments, so I love music. Mm -hmm. So music is important to me. So that is one way of dealing with it. I find myself also um, composing letters to the editor. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to fill my head with other stuff. Mm -hmm. So to try and take away the space that they might invade. It's like Christians to say, if you have an empty mind, the devil will invade it. Mm -hmm. Or if I have an empty mind, my voices will invade it. Mm -hmm. So I try and fill it with something else. I find myself doing mental arithmetic. No, times tables, subtractions, sure. additions to try and um, make, have my mind alive with something else happening in there yeah. to, 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 to distract or to fill that, fill that void. 
So that's actually a really interesting thing, Sandy. <laughs> Have you heard about the phenomenon of an earworm? Have you heard of this idea? Yeah. It's when people get a song stuck in their and they head. they can't, can't get it out. Yeah. yeah. There was a really interesting study done a couple of years ago that um, tested the use of mental arithmetic in oh. getting rid of an earworm. Oh, I didn't and know it that. was effective. <laughs> My own, my own strategy has been documented. There you go. You've worked it out. <laughs> I've worked it out. That's um, so, uh, okay, so there's way you've developed some coping strategies mm. to help you navigate and mm. buffer the impact of the voices. That's, mm. I'm glad to hear that. It doesn't always work, that. though. It doesn't always work, yeah. unfortunately. But you're very resilient as well. Oh, I try to be. Mm. Like, I just crash through sometimes and just think, oh, fuck it, what, 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 what can I do? Mm. Sorry, I just swore. <laughs> It's all right. <laughs> um, okay, so wow, look at all of these comments. Um, wow, look at all these questions. All right, mm, where do we start? I don't know. Um, Hi, Sandy. Could you share a few things about your recovery experience? So mm. that's an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, recovery. What? What's? Uh, yeah. What have been maybe some important factors in your recovery? Oh, there are some important factors. I mean, the thing is, I haven't gone into irretrievable madness as I, as was as was predicted or as the mm. prognosis said. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. I didn't go mad and stay mad. I have I have I have meetings with my madness episodic meetings with it but I'm, mm. I'm not mad 24 7 mm. uh, which is really uh, heartening my recovery strategy has been to implement team sandy so i have team sandy yeah and team sandy consists of the friends with whom i live who i've lived mm -hmm. with for the last 45 years or whatever it is 47 years we've met at university my two my two lovely girls um, mm. They're part of Team Sandy. I see a psychologist and psychiatrist regularly. Mm -hmm. They're part of Team Sandy. I my hockey team is part of Team Sandy. Mm. Team Sandy, you know, I play hockey. That's really I love hockey. It's important yeah. that I play it yeah. for, for, my, for physical activity and for sociability. So, so my hockey team is part of Team Sandy. Um, I play um, fiddle in the Footscray Gypsy Orchestra. Oh, really? That's part of Team Sandy. Wow, you're multi-talented. Oh, not really. I'm, I'm a hack player, but <laughs> I do play fiddle in the Footscray Gypsies. That they're part of Team Sandy. There's also a local orchestra at Christmas Hills where I live, which I play in. They're okay. part of Team Sandy. I play viola in them. Mm. Um, um, my poetry is part of Team Sandy, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and, and yeah our, our I get pets, that. Our pets. We have yes. three, three cats and a dog. They're part of Team Sandy. Very therapeutic pets, Very, aren't they? Oh, well, sometimes they are. Sometimes they drive you mad. Well, that's true. Uh, the cats really can drive you mad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're part of Team Sandy. Um, medication regime is part of Team Sandy. Mm. You know, mm. when, and I'm on one that sort of relative, is relatively benign and, and suits me and seems to quell the symptoms. So yeah. that's, that's, that's really important. Um, my poetry is part of Team Sandy. Yeah. So there are all these little building blocks of Team Sandy mm. that – Keep me in the world, mm. and without Team Sandy, I would be in deep shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so that's what I've done, and I've been good at sort of implementing this team and getting it in place, and yeah. and and sustaining it and, and curating it. Mm. If you don't curate your team, it will fall apart. Yeah. So yeah. I curate it, and and I do now that's by you know, trying to be a good friend and a and a, and a, and a good patient and a, and, a, and doing all the, all the things that maximise the possibility of staying sane. It does sound like you've got a very good idea about what really supports you and you know how to cultivate that and keep it going. Um, and I can hear that you you also, and this is something that Evan spoke about as well, also are very active in the recovery process. Mm. So Evan was talking about this idea that one has to be active in that process. It's not just a matter of seeing a psychologist, excuse me, a psychologist or a psychiatrist and sitting back and doing nothing. No, you got to have other, I, I, a friend. My friend Jilly says a, a, a life of total psychiatry will take away your soul, mm. and I think that's really important because I've moved beyond just being a psych patient, and I don't just rely on my therapist to give me my sanity. I have other things in my life that give me my sanity. Other things in my life that mean I'm just not a psych patient. 
I'm not just not a therapy junkie. Yeah. I think I have other things that are, that maximise the possibility of staying well. Yeah. So it's it's looking after yourself, and I I try and get I don't I, I'm also the straightest person I know. I don't drink al- alcohol. I don't mm-hmm. smoke. Mm-hmm. I don't do drugs. Mm-hmm. I don't do tea and coffee. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't do anything. I'm, I'm the straightest person I know. It's scary. Well, it sounds like it's all very sensible actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty healthy physically in a way. In a way, yeah. in terms of my mad comrades, as I call them. Yeah. I'm Tell us about your mad. My comrades. mad comrades. Well, I have my mad comrades. Um, all these people who live with you know, various mental illnesses, they're my mad comrades. But a lot of them are in appalling physical health. A lot of them smoke, have di- type 2 diabetes, are obese. You know, a lot of them are in appalling physical health because of the medications we take mm. and because of their you know, smoking and stuff. And it's just, I just despair at them, my mad comrades and how unwell they are. Yeah. And in a way, I'm a picture of health compared to them because mm. I, I'm active and do sport and mm-hmm. you know, do things that try and manage those sorts of symptoms, those, mm. those, those, the, the, the damage of the, uh, the drugs that we take. You know, we're asked to make Sophie's Choice with our drugs. Mm. And Sophie's Choice is suppose a good mental health for appalling physical health. And that's, that's our choice. And sometimes it's not even a choice. If you're an involuntary patient, you don't have a choice. Yeah. So, you know, and those drugs are incredibly powerful agents and the collateral damage they, they um, create is extraordinary in our health and in our well-being. And we are dying 20 years in the average population. Yeah, so absolutely. people are dying in their 60s basically because of the, the drugs that we take and the, the side effects yeah. and the, the long-term side effects that they have. I mean, I come from the days of the old drugs. You know, There's actually a question here there? about that. Yes. So I'm glad. So I was about mm. to ask you, uh, Levi is asking here about the medication mm. and how it affects you and if that's evolved over time, so if the old drugs were different to yeah, the new ones. Yeah. And... Well, the old drugs were things like modicate, stelazine, mm. humazide, uh, malarol, um, uh, stel- um, and uh, lagactyl. Uh, those mm. old drugs were extraordinarily uh, powerful and they were like sledgehammers. Mm. And they do now know now that the dosages in which which they gave to us back in those days, because back in those days, if they weren't recovering, they just kept upping up, uh, upping the dose. Yep. And then now they now know that they didn't need to give us the doses they gave us to be therapeutic. Sure. In fact, they over-medicated us big time. So we did the Modicate Shuffle. Mm. I know people, people wouldn't have seen that. The Modicate mm. shuffle was Modicate was an injection that was a, um, an injection that was given to you once a week, fortnight, or month, depending on the um, mm. on the dosage. And it was set in sesame oil, mm. so it was long acting. It was a, mm. a slow acting, mm. long acting drug. And we did the Modicate shuffle, which is where we had stiffened arms, stiffened legs. Our body was all taut, and mm. we shuffled along. It looks like um, Parkinson's disease. Yeah, it's called pseudo Parkinsonism mm. because it, it's it looks like Parkinson's disease. And we all shuffled around La Rundle and the corridors of La Rundle like old people who could barely get out of our way to save ourselves. The Modicate shuffle was so profound and it was awful to mm. see people shuffling. Mm. We had the Stelazine stomp. Mm. And that mm. was where you had endless an endless um, restlessness. It's called anesthesia. Yeah. Is the t- technical term, and that meant that when you stood, when you were standing, so they're standing on, on the ground. They stood up and stood there. Your feet would tread water. Mm. Like you, you couldn't mm. stay still. Your mind was restless. Your feet were restless. Your hands had a tremor. We always had a tremor in our hands. Um, these drugs were extraordinarily, um, you know, debilitating in terms of side effects. But we didn't have obesity with them. Right. You know, we, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't believe I saw people in Lorundal who were morbidly obese mm-hmm. back in the seventies and eighties. Mm. And is that more of an issue that's, now? And that's more of an issue now with a, with a mm. lanzapine and Seroquel. Mm-hmm. You've only got to breathe air and you put on weight. Mm. You know, you can go into hospital six, 65 kilos, have a course of a lanzapine for a couple of, for, for a month, yeah. and come out and then the next, and within two months you're put on uh, 20, 30 kilos. Mm. It's appalling. Mm. Um, if that happened to another cohort in the community yeah. who weren't mad, what would, wouldn't there be a hue and cry mm. about mm. it? You've got to ask the question, is it just a matter that people don't care about psych patients? But who cares? Mm. We don't care what happens to them. So um, are the drugs more efficacious now? I'm not so sure. I think with, with the newer drugs like Olanzapine and Seroquel, I, I, my feeling is what they've done is they create a chronicity of illness. So we mightn't have the florid breakouts we had with the old drugs. Like with the old drugs, I had, I had many admissions with the old drugs so I'd relapse very quickly and I'd be hospitalised. With Olanzapine and Seroquel, I haven't had lots of hospitalizations, 
but I think there's a chronicity of illness which is just a, a low level a low level chronicity which is just as debilitating as having florid outbursts. Okay. And I think I see in my mad comrades a, a low level chronicity. So I so I don't yeah. so I don't think they're necessarily being better and more efficacious in terms mm. of recovery. Mm. And I think in a way. You know, the new modern mental health system, when we closed La Rundle 20 years ago and instituted this new mental health system, it was predicated on the efficacy of those new yeah. antipsychotic yeah. drugs, yeah. I have to say, because when they were heralded, when they came in, they were, they were fanfared as being uh, uh, um, agents of change that were going to revolutionise the treatment of schizophrenia. Yeah. They were going to yeah. cure us, basically. They, they mm. were going to be the big cure. And they haven't been the big cure. Mm. People haven't recovered as, as we were supposed to. And I think now we're finding we've got a psych system which can't cope with the level of um, admissions we need to make with people. It can't cope with uh, the, the mm. level of acu acuity in the, uh, in the in people's in people's um, psychotic lives, and it's not coping. So I think it was predicated on the wrong thing. Yeah, you know, those drugs were as efficacious. So people are now mm. needing hospitalisation just as many as, as were needed in Lorundal. And what about the psychotherapy side of treatment? Have you found in your experience? anything along the lines of CBT or interpersonal therapy or some of those other ones that I've heard you talk about before? Have you heard any, um, have you had any, you know, positive experiences there? Have you found them helpful or not? Or? <laughs> I tried CBT yeah. to deal with my voices with a psychologist. I still see her, but I don't do CBT with her anymore. Mm. I failed CBT 101, unfortunately. Okay. It just didn't work. I, I know it was a matter of, you know, writing down when the voices came, what did they say, what did you, did you believe them when you heard them, how did you feel about them, all, all this stuff had to do. Mm. My voices wouldn't let me do it. It was too difficult so to do. So the voices themselves they, interrupted with, the, yeah, project, with they, the process. They were they interfered with the process and yeah. made it, just made it very, very difficult and it just got sort of untenable in a way. And I, mm. So I sort of failed CBT. Um, I don't think psychiatrists now are trained well enough to do um, therapy with people. Mm -hmm. I think they're trained. You know, they're mainly trained in drugs and, and mm -hmm. how, how to medicate mm -hmm. people. How to look. They had to try and get rid of symptoms only, mm -hmm. and they're not about connecting and making a therapeutic alliance. I think that's interesting mm -hmm. to find a to find a, a psychiatrist who will sit with you for an hour mm -hmm. and and have a yarn. Yeah, yeah I think is a, a rarity these mm -hmm. days. I have one who does do that. Thank goodness. And do you, and do you find that helpful? The, oh, yeah, um, yeah, having a yarn with her, she she can just monitor mm -hmm. me. I see it once yeah. a month. An opportunity to be heard. An opportunity and, uh, to be heard, and you can sort of talk about stuff that you don't normally talk about with your friends. You, 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 yeah. don't, want, you don't want to talk about your voices with your friends and say how distressing they are to you yeah. and how bad it is and, you know, what's happening in your head. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, your friends, are, in a way, there's this, also this tension between your friends being your friends and your carers. You know, yes. I live with my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to make them my carers all the time. Mm -hmm. In a way, they are my carers, and, and I have to live with that. But, you know, in, in that caring patient or caring carey role, there's the, that loss of power and that tension between power and powerlessness and, you know, um, people. And you know, when you've been crazy, you know that you're being watched, you're being gazed upon by your friends who, not out of malice, who out of love for you are worried about your sanity. Sure. So they're always monitoring your sanity. Mm -hmm. And so you, you've got to live like that. Like, and then like, how do you pe respond to that and how in daily life? Yeah, and, and how do you respond to it? it? It's difficult because, yeah. because it means that if you feel the gaze upon you, and you feel that you have to try and you know, maximum, uh, try and stay as sane as you can for your friends and not, not be up and down like a yo-yo. But it's, it's a pressure because it puts them in a role which they shouldn't be in. You know, they should be your friends, not, not always your carers. So there's that tension. Yeah. You know, and, and we know carers and, and people being cared for have tension in that relationship, mm. which is why a lot of consumer activists are very anti-carer because they, mm. they feel mm. there's a power, power differential. Power differential, okay. And, big and, 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 and that carers get on all the committees and all the, have all the say in the... In what's happening in the mental health world, and the consumers don't get enough say. Mm. So there's that tension. But you know. Speaking of power differentials, mm. there's an interesting question here from Dana, Dana, one of the two. Hi, Dana or Dana. Uh, thanks for your question. And uh, they say, Hi, Sandy, were there any psychologists or mental health workers more broadly, I suppose, who maybe weren't helpful with their attitudes or their behaviors? Yes. I had a psychiatrist who I saw for 27 years. Yeah, and I, I was stuck in that relationship. It was it was a toxic relationship in the end. Mm. Um, when I disclosed to her that I'd been sexually assaulted at thirteen, she made this bizarre comment that I would have been a mature thirteen year old. 
Um, yes, and, and I sort of thought, what does that mean? Mm. What is she saying? And what did she say to all people who have been abused? I would have been mature as a 13 year old. Mm. Like, I felt completely negated. She tried to tell me that I was depressed and give me antidepressants. And I sort of thought about that that situation. I thought, what is going on here? This is the wrong response mm -hmm. from, a, from a professional. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like it. And I, and I decided I needed to leave that relationship. But it took me 10 years to get out of it. I was trapped. In it. Um. I'm guessing in that relationship, there, it doesn't sound like there was a lot of opportunity for open feedback for well, you to give that feedback. No, I don't know what it was. I, I look, she had seen me through some grim times through Lorundle, yeah. and that, that was important. And but the thing was, I think I clung to the hand proffering medication because mm. because when you've been psychotic, the terrors of psychosis are so are so, are so great that you would cling to anybody who offers you help and mm. gives you some solace and gives you some peace of mind. Mm. And her. Her medication regimes were always pretty um, out there, but they had kept me sort of okay, and I think I clung to the hand-proffering medication. Yeah. And that wasn't enough. I needed more than the hand-proffering medication. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I didn't think it was a very good relationship, but it took me a long time to get out of it. And I and um, you know, so I think, I think finding people who want to talk to you and give you the time of day and spend time with your pain and let you, let, let, let you express it is really important. Yeah. But... I don't think it happens a lot in, in psychiatry. I think they're too busy medicating. And people say, and of course, the point is, how can you see a psychiatrist who charge $400 a session? Like, the people who most need to see psychiatrists can't. If you're on a pension, just disability pension, mm. you can't see a psychiatrist who charge $400 a session because you can't afford it. Yeah. You only get 150 back in Medicare. Yeah. So the people who most need to see these people can't. And I find that is, that is for me, um, a very, very bad, bad... Um, awful situation because it doesn't seem right to me. It's morally wrong. I agree, and I'm glad you raised that, mm. uh, Sandy, because up I did see when I was scrolling through the comments, somebody was asking about the um, the mental health system and what you thought of the current state of the mental health mm. system. I can't see the question right now. Uh, there's so many questions. So many questions. Sorry. About um, that. But uh, oh, here it is. So, what do you think about? So, Paulina has asked, "What do you think about the mental health care system in Australia? Should mm -hmm. it be more encompassing or less?" Well, we have a system, don't we? We we closed Lorundle back in 1999. The big mm -hmm. madhouses that used to have you know, 700 patients and locked wards and open wards. But on on at Lorundle, they had a whole lot of um stuff. There was rehabilitation on site. People were, people were taught to cook and to catch public transport, to um, to find to to, you know, to become fit functioning citizens. Uh, it was a place which has been demonised deep deeply, mm. but it offered quite a bit as well. Mm. You mm. know, it offered um, people time and space in which to get better. Mm. I think the thing we lost when we closed Lorunda was uh, a place of asylum with a garden. Yeah, it had had lovely beautiful gardens around 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 the area where you could go and find solace mm. and quiet and um, some solitude. We've lost that in our mental health system. And that was actually the original, I suppose, concept and meaning behind the word asylum, it was, isn't it? Yes. A place to find peace. A retreat, and, a, a, yeah. a sanctuary and a retreat. Yeah. And, and the people who built those big madhouses back in the early 1900s mm. um, thought that gardens were curative. Mm. And mm. they were. Mm. Yeah. So, so the, the modern day mental health system has a cycle in a general hospital. Where's the yeah. garden? There's no garden. Mm -hmm. So our health system has moved from incarcerating people for weeks, months and years, which were not, which wasn't good. The backwards of Lorunda were terrible. They were grim. They were filled with people who weren't recovered, who hadn't been rehabilitated, who were lost to the world and had been, you know, institutionalised. And we had to get, we had to close those wards. But what we've got now is a system where people go in for seven days maximum perhaps. You only get admitted if you're homicidal or suicidal. Yeah. Uh, they're the grimmest of places. Uh, nurses don't see people recover because people are discharged mad because someone mad and needs their bed. Um, people hate going to these wards because they traumatise or re-traumatise people. There's no curative gardens. There's no, um, you know, no chaplains to, to talk to. Very little therapeutic thing ha stuff happening in these wards. They're just places of absolute and utter despair. Um, women go into these wards and find themselves being mm. harassed by male patients who are psychotic and out of control. Mm. Uh, women are sexually assaulted in these wards. Um, 
these wards are very, very grim and they're not therapeutic and there's, there's not even a sense that they offer people asylum. They're to contain people for a few days, pump them full of medication, discharge them. And what do you discharge them to? Homelessness, boarding houses, perhaps a family. Who knows? And it's a really dangerous time after discharge. It's a really it? dangerous time after discharge. Uh, and people, you know, and it's it's a really grim, grim time. We had, these wards are just awful and no one likes going into them. And that's that's the problem. If you had a bad experience in one of these wards, you never want to go back. Mm. Luckily, I, I, I haven't been to the ward as a patient, but I know friends who have and I, I know what they're saying. Mm. I have private health insurance now, so I go to a private hospital when I have to be admitted. Mm -hmm. But I can be because I'm not too bad when I'm unwell. I'm not out of control and needing to be contained in a locked ward yeah. like people do. But all these acute wards are locked. They're jails. Um, and because they're full of only the most acute people, they're just absolute places of despair. And then mm. and the nursing staff sit in the fishbowl because they're either doing paperwork or they're too scared to go out and be with the patients because the patients are too scary. So it, it's just a recipe for disaster. So there is... There has been very recently, and there is ongoing in terms of collating the feedback, a royal commission into the Victorian mental health system. Yeah. Um, did you testify at that one? I didn't testify, but I, I, was, I was involved in some submissions. Yeah, right. Mm. So I testified at that, and Michelle obviously testified as well. Mm. Um, Janet Ma, mm. uh, I was just reminded of, of some of the stories that she told about inpatient experiences, mm. um, predominantly ne very negative experiences. Mm. Um, do you think now with the commission is a really valuable opportunity for us to meaningfully change things? And um, do you think that... Uh, people with lived experience such as yourself should play an important role in that sort of reconfiguration of the system? Well, I don't know how they're going to reconfigure it. They've, got, they've only got the bricks and mortar they have now. Yeah, right. How are they going to suddenly, I mean, they need, obviously they need more beds, but they also need more preventative stuff. And, uh, yeah. play, you know, you need, you need more places for people to go when they're starting to fall apart yeah. so they don't completely fall apart and have to be put in, into an acute locked psychiatric ward. So mm. we need more parks, the prevention and recovery centres. Mm. Um, and, 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 but those places need to have more curative things like ther um, uh, sensory rooms and therapy dogs and um, really good uh, um, creative programs and gardens to wander around in. Like you need, so you need places that either pre prevent you from becoming unwell or, or give you a chance to rehabilitate when you get out of hospital. We haven't got enough of those. So environments that are really conducive mm. to mental health and to supporting recovery and reducing stress. Reducing and stress. And, and sometimes uh, I know they used to have the mantra that treating a person in their own environment was the best way to treat them. Mm. But you're assuming that they, they want to be in, uh, in, mm. in, a, in, a, in with their family 24-7 while they're unwell and, and that, that the family could cope with them 24-7 yeah. when they're unwell. And so there's a few assumptions there. Yes, and also that the the family experience is positive, I suppose. It's positive, and not all families and all families are positive. So yeah. that's an assumption that was made by the the, the uh, people who put this new health system into place called care in the community. Mm -hmm. The idea was you would be cared for in the community, which are you in the family home mm. or wherever you lived. But that was an assumption that people could actually do it, and families could care, and yeah. you, know, you want to be cared for. Sometimes when I'm really unwell, I don't want to make my friends, my carers, and my jailers. Mm. I don't want to do that. I don't mm. want them to have to look, out, look over me 24-7 to make sure I don't do a runner, mm. you know. I don't want to make them my jailer. So I'm happy to be in a facility somewhere and be cared for by professionals who know how to care for men mentally ill pe people. I agree. So th there's a couple of questions here um, around mental health care facilities mm -hmm. and there's a link I'm seeing thematically in the, the questions here to stigma about mental illness and stigma about schizophrenia. Mm. So one of the things that we've observed following deinstitutionalization and the promotion of community treatment, for example, is that um, members of the general public will say, yes, I think that, um, you know, people living with mental health issues should be able to access treatment in the community. They mm. shouldn't have to be locked away just not in my backyard. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Well, as I was saying before, I think there's a perfect storm of stigma brewing mm. in our community. There are two narratives that are coalescing. The first narrative is that the mental health system is in crisis and people aren't getting treatment when they need to be treated. 
The second narrative is the what I call the Gargasulas effect. Mm. That after James Gargasulas did the thing in the Berk Ber Street Mall, mm -hmm. he had a diagnosis or label paranoid schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So in the public's mind, paranoid schizophrenia equals James Gargasulas mm. and his bad behaviour. And since Gargasulas has been there, have been other people who have done some inappropriate things who also have mental health as, a, as an issue in their background. Mm. So the co the coalescence of those two narratives is, I think, spooking the public. And I think it's creating a, a rising tide of intolerance towards the mentally ill yet again, and particularly towards those of us who live with schizophrenia. Mm, you know, mm. it's it's a label that's laden with baggage. It's, it's got so much baggage from years and years of you know mis yeah. mis mis uh, misapprehensions of the of the illness, misunderstanding of the illness, and uh, and unfortunately from people who have been have, have, have had had the diagnosis doing some unfortunate things. Yeah. I mean, I stand before audiences many times and say, I have schizophrenia and I am not a monster. Mm. But, you know, it takes one James Gargasulist to set back that stigma campaign 20, 30 years. I've been involved in so many stigma campaigns over the years to destigmatize schizophrenia, mm. and I find that the, the, the public still have fear, loathing, um, and, and apprehension towards those of us who carry the label. And because James Gargasulis and, and other people do these horrible things, it does us a disservice and it means that um, I've got to keep standing for an audience and reaffirming that I'm not a monster because people assume that we're all like Gargasulis. It's very yeah, it's that's, distressing. It's so distressing. That's such an interesting point. Just before we... Um met this morning, I met with um, Georgie Harmon, the CEO of Beyond Blue. Oh, Beyond Blue, yeah. And we were talking about this observation that over the last 10, 15 years uh, in Australia, attitudes towards anxiety and depression have improved significantly. Oh, because they've celebritized yes. it. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. attitudes towards schizophrenia have actually become worse. They've become worse. They've become worse. So they've done a fabulous job in normalising anxiety and depression mm. because Ian Thorpe has it, because, mm -hmm. you know, celebrities have it. And I, I, I'm really very, very, I hate the celebritization of it. Okay. You know, I'm sick of celebrities becoming out and having depression and anxiety because mm. they don't lose their celebrity status when mm -hmm. they do it. They're so brave for coming out. Mm -hmm. you know, how brave is it? Ian Thorpe was uh, declaring as depression. That's fine. What about the person who's down the road who can't get out of bed, is not a celebrity, has lost their job, has lost everything because their depression is so profound and they can't do anything about it. You know, they're not a celebrity. They haven't got that, that network around them to support them. I'm sick of celebrities. Where's the celebrity person with schizophrenia, though? Ask a question. Okay. So is there something there about maybe um, a perception that celebrities might profit from talking about their lived oh, I think, experience? I think sometimes they do. But, I mean, the thing is people can understand better sadness and anxiety because we all have sadness and anxiety of some sort. Yeah. We understand it better. Mm. We, uh, and, and you can sort of always make the leap towards, well, profound sadness being depression. Yeah. People will find it too hard to understand the psychotic experience. Mm -hmm. You know, if you haven't been mad and lost your reason and lost your grip, grip on sanity, mm -hmm. you can't understand what it means unless you've experienced it, I don't think. Mm. So... So schizophrenia is very enigmatic. It's um, bizarre. People act, people have it act, act in bizarre ways in front of other people. They look strange. They act strange. They say bizarre things. It's so incomprehensible mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. that I think that, you know, stigmatising is much easier because we're just those crazy people. And we can be difficult when we are crazy. We can mm -hmm. be horrendous to be with. We can be you know, very, very bizarre, difficult, um, no, no, non-compliance non and, you know, and, and, and just a nightmare to be with when we're unwell. Mm -hmm. And that makes people wary of us. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with people who are psychotic or hearing voices? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a really strange experience, one that isn't easily normalised as depression mm -hmm. and anxiety mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. I think. I, I completely agree with mm -hmm. you. Are we, you know, um, a lot of the work that we do in my research lab is looking at how specific elements of different mental health issues elicit different types of stigma. Mm. Um, and so, for example, in response to experiences like hearing voices that the average Joe can't relate to in terms of imagining what that would be like, mm. they might think that, oh, that means that person's unpredictable. Mm. Untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. Uh, yeah. I'm going to keep my distance. I'm mm. a little bit afraid. Mm. 
um, which of course is a misled stereotype, mm. right? We aren't all untrustworthy, but we are difficult sometimes. We have to, and we have to acknowledge that. If we, 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 we don't acknowledge that we do difficult and strange sometimes when we're doing ourselves a disservice. I completely agree with mm. you. So I think this is a really interesting point in the mental illness stigma area. We so often think about stigma reduction or sort of um, practicing um, stigma reduction or showing your support for mental illness, living that support in terms of clicking like on the Beyond Blue page <laughs> right. on Facebook, yes. right? Yes. But displaying empathy is actually a challenge. Mm. It's difficult when people are unwell. Mm. And I think I told the, the group when I first started uh, lecturing around some of my own experiences and uh, I uh, lost my uh, brother to uh, suicide a couple of years ago oh, after a very long experience of anxiety, depression, mm. and psychosis. Mm. And living compassion, which is, of course, the flip side of um, stigma to a point, mm. exercising that compassion is not always um, hygienic, like clicking like. <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's gritty sometimes. Mm. It mm. takes work. It takes work. Um, but just like any other, I suppose, skill or undertaking, if you do it, it's good for you mm, as well to mm. develop that, that sort of... Uh, so to have that capacity of empathy is amazing. Mm. And we don't all have it, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And it's hard to empathise with something that's so strange it's before you. But, you know, because we're, our behaviour has been so bizarre and that, that psychosis is such an enigmatic condition... There has been an imperative in the medical community, particularly in the early twentieth century, early to mid twentieth century, that doing anything to cure the madness was better than doing nothing, mm. and that was sort of the mantra. And that led to things like lobotomy, mm. you know, insulin coma therapy, mm. uh, being injected with horse serum, having our organs removed, having our teeth removed. Like there was this, no, there's this compulsion to try and cure your madness. Yeah. And so doing anything is better than doing nothing. And that mm. leads to all sorts of abuses of people with, med with mm. psychotic illnesses. Mm. Mm. And that's been fascinating, mm. actually. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Look at these questions. Oh, people are very thankful. Uh, so Vora says, thanks so much for sharing your story with us, Sandra. Uh, Sandy, this has been profoundly uh, insightful, smiley face emoticon. <laughs> um, I'm seeing a lot of questions here about something I did want to ask you about. Mm. And that is about your advice for students who might be experiencing mental health issues or starting to experience yes. mental health, health issues. What would your advice be? It's a tricky one. I mean, as long as you, have, if you know you're, you still have a connection with reality, but you know you're sort of unraveling a bit. If you think you are, seek help. Um, if you're hearing voices, don't make that, uh, don't shut yourself off. Let people talk to you about your voices. So try even say to people, I'm hearing voices, so that you so that you can try and get it out there that this might be happening in your head. And if you, if you can have, if you, if you can talk about hearing your voices with somebody else, it, it might help you to understand what they're about and, you know, perhaps wrest some control from them. But I suppose the thing is to remember that, you know, your friends and family are not your enemy. If you're becoming mentally unwell or you have a mental illness, the illness is the enemy, and that's what you have to deal with. Don't don't make your friends and family your enemy by being paranoid about them. Fight your paranoia and try and allow your friends and family to help you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not your enemy. It's the illness that's the enemy. You know, I have a friend who says to me, she's loyal to my wellness, she's not loyal to my illness. Mm. So she does things to me that, that I might not like, but she does it because she's being loyal to the well person she knows I can be. Okay. So your friends and family might take that advice on board, being loyal to your wellness, not loyal to your illness. But, you know, it's a tricky one. If you're unravelling, it's, it's hard to deal with. It's hard to get help if you're, if you're in denial, if you're afraid of what help might look like. Now, don't be afraid of the helping profession. Now, don't be afraid to see a psychiatrist. They're only people. And, mm. they're only, and sometimes they're dumb asses and sometimes, you know, they're not, they're, they're not all smart asses like they think they are. So, so you know, if you need professional help, seek professional help. Seek a therapist of some kind, psychologist, psychiatrist, if you can bloody afford it. I don't know if you can. Um, well, there's lots of free um, it, mental health services on, uh, on uh, campus. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so utilise those. If you think you've got a problem emerging, don't be afraid of it. 
try and nip it in the bud and seek help because help is what's going to help you and don't push your friends away from you don't become so paranoid and push your friends away because you will need your friends to help you you'll need your friends to be your team around you mm. otherwise you're going to be in trouble because uh, once you become isolated and lost in your own little mind and well mind you're going to be in deep trouble yeah. Um, so don't shun your so friends. So seek help early then. Seek help early. Don't yeah. push your friends away. You know, if you've got friends that you can, you can confide in, do so. And don't don't think that because you confide in them, it might push them away too. You know, if you have good friends, they won't go away. If you engage them and don't become paranoid about them. But, you know, it's a tricky one because mental illness can sneak up on you. It can sneak up on you un unwittingly and, yeah. and, and you can get it unknowingly. And suddenly yeah. you're embroiled in a full full-on crisis and you thought, no, no, I've done it, I've done it. Now I, It snuck up on me. Suddenly I'm, I'm floridly psychotic and then when I get well again, I think, shit, how did that happen? Mm. Why didn't I see it coming? Yeah. I don't see it coming sometimes mm. because it's so insidious the way it happens. Yeah, it right. sort of inveigles its way into your mind. It inveigles its way into your thought patterns and your thought processes and suddenly there's voices. Then they take you over and you're lost. Could I have done better in the beginning? Perhaps I could have done better by mm. being a bit more aware. But yeah. it's a very, very tricky thing because that's why it's mental illness and why it's so hard to deal with because it is enigmatic, it is mystifying, and it can grab you without you knowing it. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem. Thank you so much for all of these oh. insights today, Sandy. I really appreciate it. And there's just a long list of, quest of uh, people here saying thank you so much, Sandy, oh. for taking the time sharing your experiences. This has been so helpful and educational. Oh, look at this. You're Thanks, Sandy. You're a queen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, look, lots of love coming through now. That's, uh, so everybody, that's where we're going to call it because okay. they've got to pack up the lecture theatre uh, right now. It's time for the next lecturer to come on. And of course, effectively, this is my last lecture with you uh, as well. So Thank you so much for being part of this live stream and making it what it was well, and thanks answering for having these. Me. Thanks for having me, people. Oh, gosh. I hope it was helpful. I think we need to make Sandy a, a, a regular part of the lectures, don't you? I think we need Sandy to come back. <laughs> I'm happy to come back. Oh, lots of lots of people yeah. very thankful. That's oh. wonderful. Thanks, everyone. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Mm. And and again, I really appreciate oh, your time right. and uh, effort and um, willingness to just be so candid and help uh, the students learn. That's it's my, just my such pleasure. a valuable addition yeah. to the, the curriculum. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm it. glad it was helpful. I hope it was helpful. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for... Uh, <laughs> sticking with us throughout the entire clinical psychology lecture series. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will see you again soon for my coordinator live streams. So uh, bye from me bye. and uh, bye from Sandy. <laughs> bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. There you go.